This is a great opportunity for presenting one of my patients, that is uh, the sequencing of DNA. You can understand that I have a difficult uh, task today because uh, to talk after uh, Professor Brenner is more or less like trying to play a guitar after a concert of Bruce Sprinting or Paco de Lucia. It's quite similar to that. So I will try to do my best and I will try to convince you today that sequencing DNA has a, a long future. So I will very quickly, because I have many slides like a movie, uh, because I have to, to reach the end of my presentation to present two movies that I would like to, to show you uh, uh, in, in a few minutes. So uh, don't worry, relax, try to absorb the, 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 the presentation and then you can uh, try after the presentation to mature the, the ideas. So let's go. So probably you will agree that uh, one of the, the, the best or probably the, one of the, the most important challenge that uh, the humanity got during the last century was the sequencing of the human genome. So probably uh, uh, because of the, the, the great uh, advance of the Human Genome Project and the, was a motor to, to produce this kind of changes in, in, in this uh, uh, terrific and very complicated project. So we will talk today about that. And the history started many, many years ago, about 150 years ago when this guy uh, showed us the presence of something that he called nuclein. This, this is a mixture of a nucleic acid that nobody take care of at that moment. Takes around 100 years to, to become something important for biologists' DNA. So until the middle of the, of the last century, nobody take care of this molecule. So we will talk about of diversity because you think that all of us are equal, but this is not true. This is not true. If you have the opportunity to open the, the brain of, of Professor Brenner, you could find inside an intel, a, a very powerful professor that I have not. So we are different, of course. So we will try to demonstrate this diversity. And the first a guy probably that opened this, this, this door was Archibald Garrett. Just at the beginning of the last century, they show us something important because they present the first proof of Mendelian genetic in human and establish the first relationship among enzymes, genes, adverse reaction to drug ingestion. This is very important because he provides a concept very important for uh, pharmacology. They, they say something similar to predisposition to a disease is nothing else but biochemical individuality. Diseases can only be properly studied in the light of individuals. Genetic susceptibility, which in turn rests on biochemical individuality. This is a, a very important concept in order to, to understand pharmacology. Moreover, so you have to keep in mind that all the diseases has at least two components. One is genetic component and the other one is environmental component. Depending on the disease, the, 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 uh, the importance of this component is different. So in some diseases, it's more important the uh, genetic component. In the other, it's more important the environmental components. So you can imagine that about 8% of the people before age 25 is diagnosed with a disease with a significant genetic component. You will see that there is a, a, a large number of, let, let's go. Uh, so there is a large number of monogenic diseases, but of course most of them are multifactorial diseases. So that are more complicated to, to understand. So at the end, this, uh, a specific variation, the most simple variation probably, is the one that we call single nucleotide polymorphism. If you compare two individuals, 
one patient, you can find in a specific region of DNA some variation, one C by one G, one T by one A. This is a single polymorphism. So why this is important? This is important because in some cases, if you compare to, to patient uh, with uh, uh, in which you are trying to, to establish the response to a drug, one patient could not present side effects uh, and, and the other patient present side effects. And then if you compare the fragment of DNA, you can find some variation. And then at the end, you can say, you can predict which patient, this one will not have side effects and this one could have side effects in response to a drug. So, this is important because this is the main principle of something that we call the personalized medicine. Yes, it's the, the principle, the right drug at the right dose for the right patient, perfect. You don't like this? Yeah, of course. So at the end, probably in the, in the near future, probably the next week, we will have something similar to this uh, that we can call the, the, the identity, the genetic identity car, in which you can find inside a chip with all your variation, with all your genome. And then, probably we can predict something similar to this one, with a, a high probability, because probably you are a low metabolizer of drugs. This is important for establishing a dose of, of one simple drug like an aspirin. But of course you can find other things like the probability to have colon cancer or some mental diseases. So we don't know at this moment about many diseases, but believe me that in the near future we will be able to predict some things. So in fact, you can compare in this picture the, the probability of some specific cancer cells. Uh, you can see here this picture that is represent the, the expression of a specific genes in two kinds of individual that has all of them apparently the same lymphoma. And you see that in here some, some genes are expressed in, 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 in more amount than other. And in this patient in blue, some, uh, the same genes are expressed in lower amount than this one. So if you compare the survival of this person, this person die and this one not die. So it could be very important to understand the uh, situation of this cancer cell in order to provide a drug, an efficient drug to this person. Moreover, recently it was approved by the FDA, one of the first drug in which to, to be prescribed by the, by the physician, you need uh, to have previously the PCR, this is a, a proof that you have this mutation, BRAF U600A. 600, this is valine by, by glutamic acid. If you have not this mutation, the physician cannot prescribe this drug for this kind of cancer of melanoma. So this is one of the first example of personalized medicine at this moment. So probably we have to think that yesterday the physician look at us in this way, but now they are looking at us as a chromosome, of course. So just to go to the human genome, some, some figures. Uh, the genome is like a book in which probably uh, you can think about that, like a gene as a paragraph of this book. In the case of the human genome, we have around 3,000 uh, million nucleotides something like about three million characters in a book. One page of a conventional book contains an average of 2,000 characters. So a book of 50 or 500 pages will contain one million characters. So you will need around 3,000 books to contain all the DNA. It's a very large, very large library. So we will see how to manage this information. So, at the, at the beginning, we know that the cost of the first human sequence was about $3 billion. This means that it costs $1 per 
base per nucleotide. So one, one colleague, that is uh, Craig Venter Foundation, opened a, a prize to reach the sequencing of a genome by only 1,000 euros. And then it started the race that we call the, the, the race of the 1,000 euros. So this race, well, it started very, very recently, but you can imagine the cost of this race. So because the first genome that was sequencing was in, in 1977 by the two uh, Nobel Prizes, uh, Gilbert and Sanger, and well, was a, a, a bacteriophage, you will see the a high amount of nucleotide they have, only, only 5,000 base pair, and it takes years to sequence this, years to sequence this. So, at the very beginning, when I started to work in this, in the, in the 80s, uh, we made the, the sequencing uh, manually. So, we take something like a week to, to obtain only 200 base pair. And at that time, there was not computer, and we have to read the sequence like G, G, C, C, T, T, T. Wait a minute, how many T's, you say? No, no, start again. So we take, you can imagine how long will it take to, to get the human genome, three billions, by 200 base per by week. How many people should be involved? How many years? Calculate. So, but uh, because of the pressure appeared, the first generation of the, uh, uh, that we call automatic DNA sequencing, so it's appeared in the, in the late of the 80s and the, in the beginning of the 90s. The first one was uh, uh, by plate electrophoresis, then appeared the capillar electrophoresis, I will go ahead. And at that time, we were able to read something similar to this one around 0.3 megabases per day. So this made possible the sequencing of the human genome because the technology advanced to this, to this level. So at this moment, using this technology, we can find a specific mutation in the genome and detect a mutation that could be, for, for instance, related to monogenic diseases. But the, the, the challenge was, uh, according to the Craig Venter Foundation, was to obtain massive, massive uh, sequencing. So this is that we call next generation sequencing. So what can change the next generation sequencing? Of course, next generation sequencing can change a lot of things. So for instance, it will uh, influence uh, something like uh, functional genomic, epigenetic, microbial ecology, metagenomics, evolutionary genomics, pharmacogenomics, and so on, and also system biology. That is important, I think. So what changes this next generation sequence? At the very beginning, just to sequence a, a human genome, we have to clone every fragment of the DNA using bacteria. And then we have to purify the clone, obtain the plasmid, and then sequence it. But now with the, next, the, the new technologies, we have not to purify the, the, the clones, and we use all the fragments of DNA using something that we call cyclic arrays. This is a metric in which we deposit all this fragment, and we were able now to sequence individually all the fragments. So we will see. We have changed the cloning in bacteria by cloning in a small bits, in, in, in a small bit, or just in, in a plate by using this, this type of amplification technologies. So we have two kinds or several kinds of, of, of uh, instrument now. One of the first one was this one. The, the, the name is 454. Uh, and this one used a nanotechnology. You can see here that we can deposit every piece of DNA, of course, previously amplified in this kind of panels. So you can put one single molecule, well, well, one single bit in one of these panels, and then obtain the sequence in this hole. So at this moment, using this, this instrument, we can sequence something similar to 
700 base per, per read, and we can obtain something like uh, seven, 700 uh, megabases per, per one day. But using this one, you can obtain something similar. You will see here in, in the around two human genomes only by around $10,000. So we are near the, 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 the winning the, the price of Craig Venter. So there are other, other systems. This is the one that provided by, by um, uh, Solid. And in this case, you can see here that we are now able to sequence 300 gigabases in one week. You compare 200 base pair some years ago in one week with 300 gigabases in one week. So we are now in good condition, good shape to, to solve many problems. But more important, we have learned something important. Now we don't need to sequence everything because you know that there is something that we call the exome that is a, a part of the genome. If you have the library, you can imagine the library with 3,000 books. The coding sequencer for protein is just only in about 50 books. So we don't need, well, we don't need. We can only sequence 50 books. And for doing that, it, at this moment, is possible by using a specific capture method. Uh, it costs, at this moment, only 1,000 euros. So, 1,000 dollars. So, uh, there are many, many types of capture by chip technology, by using microbit and magnetic bits, and many, many, many different things. But we have now the third generation. One of this uh, generation is provided by a company that the name is Complete Genome, Genomics, and they provide now a, a, a complete genome by only $5,000. So we are very near, no? And uh, they use a, a complicated uh, a combinatorial proof anchor ligation technology. This is the one of my favorite. This is the new ion torrent equipment that cost is, well, I have to say that most of this equipment cost something like half million euros. So it's, it's quite expensive, like a house here, more or less. But uh, in this case, we have the possibility to obtain this, this small equipment that uh, they, they call ion torrent. Uh, 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 with this small chip, we are able to sequence, you will see, in, in, in something similar to the 454 system, but in this case, we use a simple, very simple property uh, that is the pH. You know, we can measure and we can detect DNA by using that, by simply measuring the pH, like a pH meter. So, this is incredible. So, we can now uh, use this technology. I am going very quickly because I would like to present you the movies. We can now uh, uh, have with one of these chips, you can see with the, the fingers the, 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 the size of this small chip, something like one gigabase per run, a very, very low price. I am, I am selling the, the, the technology, you know? Uh, but this is the, the, the real challenge. Up, up to now, we were not able to sequence single molecules. You can imagine a single molecule? No, we have to amplify the molecule previously in order to get the sequence. But now we can sequence single DNA molecule. What, how? I will show you in a minute. So this is one of the technology, is the PAC BIOS uh, technology. The, 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 the equipment at this moment is very big. In, in one important thing, in this case, they can read something like about 10,000 base per, per read. One of the problems of, of reading DNA is most of these technologies only read a small fragment of DNA, and this is very important in order to, to obtain a, a complete, uh, to assemble a, a complete genome. But in this case, they provide a reads of this length. So, how? Well, m more important, for the first time, this can also read modificated bases. So this is very useful to understand epigenetics. So not only read the basis, but also provide you information 
about the modification of the bases. That is very, very critical and very important for, for epigenetics. So I will try to show you this one. Pacific Biosciences is developing a transformative DNA sequencing technology that will revolutionize the field of genetic analysis by enabling researchers to answer questions important to human healthcare. We call it SMART, Single Molecule Real-Time DNA Sequencing, a breakthrough technology based on the natural process that occurs every time living cells divide. Prior to division, DNA is replicated by enzymes called DNA polymerases, which efficiently duplicate entire genomes in minutes by reading the DNA and sequentially building a complementary strand with matching building blocks called nucleotides. Pacific Biosciences Smart Sequencing harnesses the power of the polymerase as a sequencing engine by eavesdropping on it while it works to replicate DNA. This approach is enabled by two proprietary technologies. The first is phospholinked nucleotides. To visualize polymerase activity, a different colored fluorescent label is attached to each of the four nucleotides, A, C, G, and T. In contrast to other sequencing approaches, our phospholinked nucleotides carry their fluorescent label on the terminal phosphate rather than the base. Through this innovation, the enzyme cleaves away the fluorescent label as part of the incorporation process, leaving behind a completely natural strand of DNA. This enables us to exploit the inherent properties of the DNA polymerase, including high speed, long read length, and high fidelity. The second key technology is a nanophotonic visualization chamber called the Zero Mode Waveguide, or ZMW. It enables observation of individual molecules against the required background of labeled nucleotides, while maintaining high signal to noise. The ZMW is a cylindrical metallic chamber approximately 70 nanometers wide that is illuminated through its glass support, creating an extremely small detection volume, just 20 zeptoliters. Nucleotides diffuse in and out of the ZMW in microseconds. When the polymerase encounters the correct nucleotide, it takes several milliseconds to incorporate it during which time its fluorescent label is excited, emitting light that's captured by a sensitive detector. After incorporation, the label is clipped off and diffuses away. The whole process repeats, creating sequential bursts of light corresponding to the different nucleotides. These are recorded, thus building the DNA sequence. Our smart sequencing harnesses the polymerase's natural ability to synthesize 10 or more bases per second over thousands of continuous incorporations, leading to high speed and long read sequencing. Additionally, our smart technology design allows simultaneous multiplexing of thousands of ZMWs in parallel, all concurrently replicating DNA in real time. The data is assembled into whole genomes and analyzed by researchers. Our smart sequencing technology will ultimately translate nature's ability to replicate an entire genome in under an hour to an instrument that will sequence a human genome in minutes for under a hundred dollars. This unprecedented level of performance will completely redefine the field of genetic analysis and will enable new scientific advancements that will lead to improved healthcare worldwide. This is the nanopore technology. Yes, because I'm in a hurry, I will show you something incredible. You will see. Oxford Nanopore Technologies is developing two methods of DNA sequencing, strand sequencing and exonuclease sequencing. At the heart of both methods is a protein nanopore. This model shows a typical nanopore made from protein. You can see that at the core of the protein is a hollow tube that is only a few nanometers in diameter. Oxford Nanopore designs and manufactures bespoke nanopore structures for a range of applications. In nature, nanopores form holes in membranes. In Oxford Nanopore's system, the nanopore is inserted into a membrane created by a synthetic polymer. This membrane has very high electronic resistance. Here you can see a nanopore piercing a single hole in a membrane made from synthetic polymer. 
A potential is applied across the membrane, resulting in a current flowing only through the aperture of the nanopore. Single molecules that enter the nanopore cause characteristic disruptions in the current. By measuring that disruption, the molecule can be identified. In strand sequencing, an intact DNA polymer is sequenced as it passes through the nanopore. Here you see a DNA enzyme complex approaching the nanopore shown in blue. The enzyme shown in green is designed to ratchet the DNA strand through the nanopore one base at a time. The enzyme binds to the end of a double strand of DNA and unzips the double strand to form a long single strand which it feeds through the nanopore. As the DNA strand moves through the nanopore one base at a time, a characteristic disruption in current is created by the presence of particular combinations of bases in a particular part of the nanopore. Because these disruptions in current are so specific to the different combinations, this information can be used to determine the order of bases on that DNA strand. There is no deterioration of accuracy as the long DNA strand is sequenced. By preparing the DNA so it has a hairpin structure at its end, the system can read both strands, that is the sense and antisense strands of the DNA. This gives advantages in data analysis. In exonuclease sequencing, a nanopore is coupled with a process of enzyme shown here in green. Individual DNA bases are cleaved from the end of the DNA strand. As they pass through the nanopore, they transiently bind with an adapter molecule, a cyclodextrin, shown here in red. The characteristic disruption in current caused by each binding event is used to identify the base in sequence. In order to create a high-throughput system, a number of nanopore experiments can be conducted at the same time by using an array chip. Multiple microwells are fabricated onto an array chip using standard semiconductor materials. These array chips may be scaled according to need. The user may require tens of channels to hundreds of thousands of channels depending on the application. This array chip is built into a consumable cartridge which also contains the fluidics required to run the chip. The analyte is added to the cartridge which is then used in conjunction with an instrument, the gridiron node, for real-time data collection and analysis. The array chip is also designed to be used inside the miniaturised Minion instrument. The end, the end and the future is just to look at the DNA sequence ju just by electronic microscope. So, in the future we will be able to read single molecule by your eyes. So, uh, what is the, the next future? We don't know but probably we will create more powerful technologies. So thank you very much, and don't be afraid because we have still the password to, to go ahead with the, with the DNA. Thank you very much for your attention.